Night in the Woods is the story of Mae Borowski, a 20-year-old who moves back home with her parents in the small town of Possum Springs. She's dropped out of college in her sophomore year, though she doesn't really want to talk about it. Besides, this is her first time back home in almost two years, and she's got a lot of catching up to do with her friends. There's Greg, an excitable switchblade-wielding fox who works at the Snack Falcon. There's also Greg's boyfriend, Angus, who works at the video store and is a quiet nerd. And then there's Bee, Mae's best friend from when they were little kids until they kind of weren't anymore. And until the last little bit of the game, most of Night in the Woods consists of May hanging out with these characters to recapture the sort of youthful misadventures she remembers from years ago, from practicing with their garage band to petty theft and vandalism. But two years is a long time, and May doesn't seem to realize that the friends she remembers as bored high schoolers are all young adults moving on with their lives, which isn't easy in a small town that threatens to swallow as many lives as it can. It's clear from the premise that Night in the Woods is very much a coming-of-age story for May, and I feel like the first instinct is to compare it to Catcher in the Rye or Ghost World, or some other story with a rotten, spoiled protagonist who's never really faced adversity, finding it hard to find themselves. And yeah, it is a coming-of-age story, and May definitely is an immature woman-child who struggles to really get what others are going through. But I would argue the game succeeds not just by telling a compelling coming-of-age story, which it does, but by intertwining that quest for identity with economic concerns until the two concepts become inseparable. May's struggle to understand why she can't go back to the way things were is both a struggle to grow as a person and a struggle to come to the grips with the socioeconomics of Possum Springs. And at times it feels like Possum Springs is as much a character in the game as our four leads. It's ever-present, as much for the characters themselves as well as the player. A lot of that is achieved by placing B, Greg, and Angus on the other side of the town from May's house. The distance between them is filled with NPCs who have distinct personalities and different types of interactions, and stories that occur each day in different areas of the town. Whether the player is listening to Selmer's poetry, or checking out Dusk Stars with an old high school teacher, or overhearing people decrying the defacing of a mural, or just looking around town to find what's new each day, the city manages to feel vibrant and alive. It's also easily ignored if you're not really looking for any of that stuff, and I feel like this is one of the things people tend to criticize the game for somewhat unfairly, that it's slow and that there's a lot of walking around that could just be edited out or condensed. And I'm kind of cool on that criticism, because while none of the city stuff is required to beat the game or understand the plot, I feel like the intent is to encourage but not require players to develop a relationship with this town because it's the driving force in the plot, at once a nostalgic childhood home and an unescapable tomb for our protagonists. Besides, there's lots of effort put into the world building. Unlike most big budget world building that exists to establish verisimilitude for immersion or create extensive lore from which to draw NPC motivations and side quests, the world building in Night in the Woods is done with specific thematic points in mind. Possum Springs is a boom town gone bust, a place where the jobs don't exist like they used to and everyone's just struggling to get by. Some of this is done in big, obvious ways. The abandoned mines say as much about the city's economic prospects as the abandoned food donkey. But others are a bit more subtle. The old pickaxe serves not only as a major motivator for B's character arc, but harkens back to the days of Possum Springs as a mining town. I mean, it's a Main Street hardware store called the Old Pickaxe. The building that Greg and Angus live in used to be a library donated to the town by the owner of the mines before it was privatized and converted into apartments. In either case, the shadow of the mining company hangs over both of them, which is not just thematically appropriate, but it's some nice foreshadowing. Or take Postabilities, which isn't just a cute restaurant pun name, but is pulling double metaphor duty. First, it kind of bookends the game. Its closure marks the arrival of May's nightmares, and its reopening as a taco place signals their end. But more interestingly, when the crew sits down to eat at the Click Clack Diner, presumably a cheaper establishment than a sit-down Italian restaurant, especially given the jokes about how bad the food is and how many rats there are, having May lament the fact that they didn't go to Postabilities establishes how she isn't quite connected to the financial realities of her friends, who ask if college girl May is too fancy to eat with them. It's a character-building moment, and one that only works if you pay attention to the town around you, and there are lots of those sprinkled throughout the game. 
Anyways, the first two-thirds of the game is relatively episodic in nature, with a structure that lets May wake up, usually in the late afternoon, talk to her mother on the way out the door, find the friends she wants to spend time with today, and then hang out somewhere around town before coming back home to speak with her father and watch some TV, and maybe play some Demon Tower before going to bed. Most of these outings don't further the overall plot, per se. They're mostly studies in both the history of the town and in May's relationship with her friends. And it's here that the game is at its strongest, exploring the lives of these 20-year-olds trapped in a town that feels like it's slowly decaying around them, how they've adapted to the realities of adulthood in May's absence, and how that impacts their relationship with her. That might mean going to a college party, or an abandoned grocery store, or just some random errand, and talking about things while you do them. Sometimes funny and snarky things, and sometimes serious things that strike an emotional chord. It's basically dicking around with friends until we stumble into emotions, the video game. And as silly as that sounds, the game manages to juggle the shifts in tone in these scenes really well. I love that May asks B out to a mall like they're still in sixth grade, only to be shocked that the mall has fallen on hard times thanks to the advent of the internet. And in this one trip to a mall, we have May push B out of her comfort zone by getting her to steal from a Hot Topic-style clothing store, then a chat about mall food and high school drama and losing faith that puts B in a bad mood, and then May managing to pull her out of it by splashing passers-by with a water fountain. We get a sense of the weight B is carrying running the hardware store, the slow decline of the mall and what that's doing to the local economy, and May's ability to simultaneously infuriate B and to get B to let her guard down and be vulnerable. On one of your outings with Greg, you ride a bike out into the woods, and knife fight, and break a log, and shoot a crossbow, and at the end of all that, stare out at a lake and have a heart-to-heart -heart about Greg's self-doubt. The game never explicitly states it, but it's heavily hinted that Greg has something akin to bipolar disorder. He says he has up days and down days, and he certainly has a lot of manic energy at times. And the rapid tone shift in this scene, having energetic and nonsensical violence that abruptly ends with a quiet conversation by a pond, conveys that up and downness really well. These daily adventures are little vignettes designed to sell the characters and the world. Some of them are more humorous, like the time Greg and May stole an animatronic prop from a defunct grocery store as a present to Angus that May gets electrocuted putting together. Others are more serious, like getting in a fight with B at her house over whether she does or does not have an obligation to run the old pickaxe for her father in light of her mother's death. The game does a really great job balancing being funny and snarky without robbing the serious bits of any of their weight, and it does a great job moving towards sad and heavy topics without coming across as mawkish or preachy. It's also refreshing in that it's the first coming-of-age game I've played in a while that doesn't really feel like it's aiming for a young adult style of voice. Not that there's anything wrong with young adult fiction, but it's just nice to see a game about maturity that wants to talk to the already mature. We don't have a lot of those. But all those self-contained episodes of gameplay don't mean there's no overarching story, and it's in the actual plot of the game where I think Night in the Woods runs into its real issues. Before we can really break it apart, though, I suppose I should give as brief a summary as I can. On Harfest, two-thirds of the way through the game, we get what is effectively our inciting incident. May witnesses a person kidnapped and dragged away by what she describes as a ghost. Then we return to our episodic structure, but now instead of fun time hangouts, May wants her friends to help her investigate these ghosts and put a stop to their plans. So you're still hanging out with your friends every day, it's just now the daily hangouts tend to end with May and her friends seemingly chased away by these ghosts as they continue looking for clues. This culminates in a breakdown of that daily episodic cycle for a more directed approach that moves May and the player directly from scene to scene. Ultimately, we get the big reveal, that there's a cult worshipping what is basically a Lovecraftian god who lives deep in the abandoned mines. The cult says that this monster has promised that the town will prosper if they keep feeding it people. The monster can also sing into people's minds via a form of telepathy, and that seems to be what has been giving May those nightmares, as well as her depressive malaise that caused her to drop out of college. Our protagonists try to leave the cult and return to the surface of the mine, but a particularly overzealous member attacks them and causes a cave-in, dooming the cultists. Then May has a final run-in with the monster in the mine, and then we head to the epilogue. So there's a lot to unpack from all that. The first thing to me is structural. Having played through the game twice, I think it's clear the intent is for there to be a slow build that continually gains tension until it explodes for a rapid pace finish. But that only works if you can see these threads slowly running together, if you can see these disparate forces on a collision course that's unavoidable even as we just go through our daily routine. 
Like, the game mentions that Casey is missing in passing, but unlike Life is Strange, he isn't a focus or a plot-motivating factor. You find an arm with a weird tattoo that seems to hint at a bigger story or reason for it to be there, but the arm itself never comes up again. You get all these hints, but none of them seem to be pointing towards anything because they never get called back. They just sort of exist and each point to their own thing. Until you get to the end of the game, you have no idea that May's abstract dreams, her dropping out of college, her drunk mentions of college being just shapes and possum springs being more than just shapes, the severed arm outside of the diner, the ghosts, Casey's disappearance, and the fate of the town itself are all interconnected. And as a result, the end has a bit of structural slash tonal whiplash. Like, watching a more loosely structured film suddenly snap into a rigid narrative with a clear villain at the very end. Imagine if the last 30 minutes of Clerks or Ghost World suddenly started telling something akin to a Scooby-Doo story. That sounds kind of insulting because of Scooby-Doo, and I don't mean it to be, but more of a critique of the structure. Maybe a more appropriate reference point would be Spike Jones's adaptation. The point is, what had been more episodic and aimless character studies set in grounded reality suddenly becomes about beating a supernatural big bad and the stakes go from the internal to the external. And that abrupt shift is jarring. But it's also kind of unavoidable given the structure of the narrative. The fact that the inciting incident doesn't happen until two-thirds of the way through the game means that Night in the Woods has to tell a whole separate story about this evil underground god in a condensed time frame. And really, given the choice between tipping the game's hand early with regard to its supernatural content or letting the realness of Possum Springs breathe for a little bit, it probably was the smarter choice even if it means the ending feels a bit disjointed from the rest of the game. But the other way to look at the ending is thematically, and I think it's far more successful in that context, if a bit on the nose. Like, so on the nose, B actually brings it up multiple times, such that it is no longer subtext, but stated plainly in the game. Basically, this cult feeds what it considers to be the dregs of society to the monster in the pit in exchange for protection and prosperity. They believe the mines will one day reopen, that the jobs will come back, that the town and the lives they built around it can be saved, and everything can go back to the way things used to be if they just continue with this horrible policy of killing people society has turned its back on long enough and hard enough. It's a really thinly veiled metaphor for the sorts of economic policies that have been hurting the people of Possum Springs, an allusion to the sorts of rhetoric that insists, we'll bring the jobs back, we just have to slash enough support systems for the poor and struggling in order to lower taxes enough to entice the businesses to return. The cult, blinded by nostalgia for a dead town, did the unthinkable. And they have nothing to show for it yet. The mine is still closed. May's dad is now on his third job, each lower paying than the last. Kids like Greg and Angus are still planning on moving away. Not only are they hurting people by chasing a memory, but it's a memory that really isn't coming back. And it's here that May's personal journey and the socioeconomics of Possum Springs fully intersect, because the ideas that drive the cult are really what this god represents, a longing for a thing you've lost that's so strong it twists you inside and removes your ability to move forward from it, that paints everything in the now as boring and ashen and, well, like May said, just shapes, and the only thing that matters is recapturing what was lost. The cultists felt this monster whispering to them so strongly they felt justified in murdering people to save their vision for Possum Springs. May felt it whispering to her at college when she was lonely and friendless for a year and a half, driving her to drop out of school and go back home to where she had friends. And May also felt it before, when her grandfather died. The intro lets you pick either a natural or economic disaster to happen on the year that he passes, and it's only at the end of the game it's clear that that happened because the monster in the pit had not been fed. It's also why it was reaching out and first found May, who was longing so very much for her grandfather to be alive that at one point during a baseball game the monster's influence over her grew so powerful that she attacked some kid and put him in the hospital. This inability to move past things that have been lost, a town's economy, a dead grandfather, the comforts of childhood, is the source of pretty much all of the ills in the game. So May's arc is to be one that goes from someone who is consumed by this monster to someone who rejects it. She decides to embrace the now, to celebrate what she has over what she's lost. In her own words, when my friends leave, when I have to let go, when this entire town is wiped off the map, I want it to hurt bad. I want to lose. I want to get beaten up. I want to hold on until I'm thrown off and everything ends. And you know what? Until that happens, I want to hope again. This is May coming to terms with 
all of the loss in the game, both personal and communal. She's recognizing that she can't hold on to Angus and Greg if they really want to move away from her, that she can't go back to the way things once were with B, that her grandfather will never tell her another ghost story, and that the town isn't going to suddenly have boom times again. Things fall apart, but rather than mourn for the past, she chooses to savor what she has before it too is taken away. In the epilogue, they kind of make light of the fact that the world is coming to an end, and that apocalypse might be literal, they may or may not have just actually angered an elder god, or it might be metaphorical for normal socioeconomic forces that dismantle the town as jobs and people continue to leave. Or it might just be the end of May's childhood as people move away and grow and her hometown becomes a place she doesn't recognize anymore. But whatever the future holds, whatever apocalypse awaits them, for the moment these four kids have each other and until life rips them apart, they're going to cling to that. Like the game's tagline says, at the end of everything, hold on to anything. So, yeah, I think the ending works thematically, even if its structure makes it feel a little stilted and awkward. For the record, the game benefits a lot from a second playthrough, both because you can catch up with whichever friend you didn't spend as much time with, there's no way to do everything on one pass through of the game, and because you can see all of the forces that were once invisible to you driving the plot. But as much as I enjoy the big picture thematics, Night in the Woods is a game I'll ultimately remember for the intimate moments. It's a game about how longing for lost things on the individual level prohibits personal growth, and how large-scale weaponized nostalgia literally kills people, sure. But it's also about May watching late night TV with her dad before bed, staring up at the stars with Angus on a chilly fall night, helping Bee put on a play for Harfest, or finding out that Selmers is actually a much better poet than she let on. It's kind of weird. Night in the Woods asks us to hold on to anything at the end of everything, implying that the pickings are slim. But really, the game's overflowing with small, beautiful moments shared between friends and family. Whatever end is coming for May, however literal or not, she's lucky to have so much to hold on to. So it really frustrates me that there's like all these little things I love in this game that I can't fit into the script. Like, I love how B finally calls May May Day at the end of the game, or how May's mother and father are rarely home at the same time, resulting in all sorts of implications about their work schedules and the stress that might be putting on their marriage, and whether that's done for financial necessity, or the game's motif of alcohol as an ill omen by tying it not only to the monster creeping back into May's dreams when she goes and gets drunk at the party and then has the first dream that night, but also by tying it to her dad's abuse. According to May, he had to stop drinking because it made him a danger to her and her mom. And when Angus's dad comes up, who is terribly abusive, May's dad says he knows him back from when he would visit the bar regularly. So yeah, alcohol equals bad is a bit of a motif. Oh, or how framing the nostalgia death cult as ghosts paints the town as ostensibly haunted by its past, which plays into that whole Rust Belt gothic thing they're going for, which is probably a whole separate reading you could do of the game. And I didn't even do the relationship of Angus and Greg justice, especially cast against the rest of the game's themes of being saved by relationships in the face of nihilistic oblivion, of which both of them feel very much susceptible to. And again, that could be its own separate topic of discussion. Also, Demon Tower. Didn't really get a chance to talk about that, but... Oh, and Charcoal. Charcoal! <laughs> yeah, Charcoal. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. I just... I, I could keep going about this game.